Hello and welcome to the next episode of the Unidu Talks podcast, where we get to hear from blockchain, crypto, fintech, and SME leaders from across the globe and discover the technology and innovations that are shaping the future of finance. My name is Joseph Crow. I'd like to welcome Nick Shuring, who's co-founder of one of the first co-working companies, Biz Dojo from New Zealand, and co-founder Michael Swan of Unidu. So thank you, gentlemen, for being here today. Awesome. Great to be here. Nick, I'd love to hear a little bit briefly about your work history with BizDojo and how that started the idea of Wonderlife and what Wonderlife is all about. Yeah, look, um, geez, I, I kind of fell into co-working, I have to say. Uh, I was working uh, with my co-founder, Jonah Merchant, at, in New Zealand at the time, and we were working on this incredible Skunk Works project, which was um, the redesign of the long haul experience for RNZ. Uh, so I'd freshly being hired in as uh, head of mobile and so leading kind of their mobile product evolution uh, and this was like right at the start of like the first iPhones dropping so it was all all really emergent and uh, and Jonah and I were in this little skunk works team who were working on a full-scale prototype of a uh, new Boeing Dreamliner plane which was actually hidden in a uh, warehouse in central Auckland so You'd walk past the building, you'd have no idea what was going on. And inside that, we actually had a full replica of a plane fuselage and we were sitting in it. We were, you know, trying different seat configurations, trying different um, sound configurations for entertainment, all sorts, you name it. It was an incredible project. And um, and it was really inspiring because it was the first time that I've been part of like an agile, multidisciplinary team uh, that was being uh you know, managed and run by Design Works in conjunction with IDEO. Uh, and it was like, it was like a kid's playground. It was like, you know, um, you guys come in and try and think about what the future of long haul travel will be like 10, 15 years from today, like try and imagine it. And it was incredible. And through that period, we had some huge successes around redesigning the experience, um, trying to come up with a more customer centric journey. Uh, and then ultimately in New Zealand, went on to win many, many awards and has done for years around its customer experience, you know, whether it was its in flight, whether it's its mobile kind of touch points, all of those things. But what was really profound for Jonah and I is we were part of a team of um, misfits, randoms and crazy um, contractors. We didn't, we weren't part of the kind of core in New Zealand team and we kind of were all independently doing our own thing and we'd sit around and go, this is amazing. Can, can, can't we do this like every day? You know, I'm sick of working by myself. I'm sick of not feeling like I had a home. And so um, just really basic beginnings in uh, 2009, we decided to get a space up on K Road, which is like um, kind of like the red light hospitality district of Auckland. Um, so, you know, quite grimy, quite edgy. Uh, which is usually where startups go. And we got this tiny little space. Um, I think our first lease was like 30 something grand a year. And we had space for about six people. Within a few months, uh, not having any idea what we were doing, uh, we ended up with about 25 to 30 people. And we just grew like a virus really from there. And so I think we were at points where we were doing three to 400% growth year on year. Uh, and we built the business up into a network of co-working spaces across New Zealand and thousands of community members working out of those environments. Um, and it was awesome. It was absolutely incredible. I, I was really um, both um, had the gift of being able to do a job that I loved every day. And also the downside of doing a job that I loved every day is nothing after that felt particularly fulfilling. Uh, started in 2009. And then I sort of jumped now to, uh, to 2018 or uh, December 2017, and we were acquired by IWG, which is the parent company of the Regis Serviced Office Group, which has got like 3,000 locations around the world worth three and a half billion pounds. And they, um, they bought this dojo, they bought the whole company outright, it was a total acquisition. Uh, and um, safe to say, I was pretty burnt out um, by that whole process. Um, uh, didn't realize the big exit like everyone hopes to as a founder. It was kind of like, geez, I've done 10 years and walked away with, uh, you know, uh, some some uh, change in my pocket and not quite sure what to do with the rest of my life. So I had a restraint of trade for a couple of years and um, decided I'm going to change country. And so I moved to, um, moved to Brisbane in Australia. And, uh, and um, because of that restraint of trade, I was like, look, what am I going to do with myself? And I, I actually ended up, um, going into the water industry, 
uh, and became the GM for a not-for-profit that's run out of the US that was launching in Australia, which is called Waterstart, and actually helped get their operations up and running here. And the whole premise of that was to try and help with technology adoption in the water industry. So um, so that was a totally like left field. So I've been used to working with founders and quite passionate about water and energy and renewables, um, but then found myself doing that. After Water Starts, I ended up joining GHD, which is a, a big global engineering firm that's led out of Australia. And with a real focus on kind of, you know, sort of being a bit of an entrepreneur in residence for them. Uh, did a couple of years with them through the pandemic. And again, that was about going, how do you build a global community of water utilities, technology companies, startups, um, to all try and solve some of the big challenges that are facing the world when it comes to water. But through all of that process, I kept having this kind of like burning itch or, you know, like just this, this like nagging in the back of my head, which was, I really, really missed co-working and I really miss being part of that vibrant community. And I was doing a little bit of soul searching, uh, you know, over Christmas when you're kind of, you know, compulsory home time. And I kind of thought back and went, you know, what was the thing that was most exciting for me? And I went, well, I, re I really enjoyed actually being around, you know, like hundreds and hundreds of founders every day. I, you know, like it was like a, it was like a playground, you know, to be able to sit there with people trying to push the envelope and do different things. And I thought, well, what if we could spin up a co-working environment that actually could bring in a living space as well? What if we could have, um, you know, uh, an apartment building, a co-working environment, a gym, all of those things. And, and part of that was I've just spent two years standing in my apartment. Welcome to my apartment, by the way, um, uh, you know, by myself, um, completely bored out of my brain, uh, super lonely and like desperate for human connection. Um, and kind of thought, well, what if we could kind of design something that could bring all of those elements of that, like remote working, you know, both all of us are obviously doing this call from our homes. Um, but also when we wanted to connect with people environment that was actually led around connection and community rather than just how you sell a desk. And that was really the genesis of Wonder Life. And I put a post out on LinkedIn uh, and said, hey, I should I don't know where to begin with this, but I'm going to do it. And um you know, and a bunch of people kind of sent me personal messages saying, I think you're crazy. You shouldn't do this. Turn, turn away now. And then, uh, and at the same time, I was getting a bunch of messages from other people saying, I don't know what you're doing, but this sounds really interesting. How can I get involved? Could you break down for our, our new listeners and people who are unaware yep. of what Wonder Life is doing and kind of give us the overview of the value proposition of what you're trying yep. to achieve? So look, one of the big challenges that we're all facing at the moment is an affordability crisis, right? You know, like the cost of living, the cost of housing is just skyrocketed. Um, here in Brisbane, we are at the lowest vacancy rates ever, 0.02%. And, and what that's meaning is a lot of people are finding it nearly impossible to even find a rental property, let alone trying to work out how they can build a deposit and get into the kind of, you know, the, um, the ladder of trying to build some liquidity in their lives. And so what Wonder Life is trying to do is make, um, we're trying to solve affordable housing, but what we're really trying to do is make it a much easier and more transparent path for people to be able to collectively share in the ownership of property. And I think that's probably for me, one of the most exciting things about Web3 and around tokenization of physical assets. So we, um, we build a building and we set that whole building up the entire community uh, rent and use those facilities in the building. And then we tokenize the entire asset into derivative tokens that the individual can acquire through their rent. So we do a rent to co-own. So whether you're working in the workspace or you're using the gym or you're living in the apartments, a percentage of every week's transaction comes back to you as a reward. You can hold that cash if you want to and accumulate it to then be able to convert it to Wonder Blocks, which is our derivative tokens or you can actually pull it out in fiat currency and use it for your life. And, a, and a, the rationale around this is that um, personally, I think that the whole property market has, the experiment has failed and that the current constructs around the finance sector and the construction sector around how they're trying to address housing clearly isn't working because many of us will never get out of the renting cycle. And in fact, many of us will find ourselves living, you know, um, basically in transient natures in cars because we just can't even get into it. And so we're trying to really solve that uh, in a smart and intuitive way. So rather than building 
a business that's wanting to have uh, a small relationship with millions of customers. Our goal is to have 10 buildings over the next 10 years and a really deep relationship with our 30,000 community members that will live, work and connect with those spaces. So the, the basic function of Wonderlife is for renters to be able to uh, build up equity almost in paying their rent rather than just throwing it away monthly. The average rent in Australia is about 35 grand a year at the moment for a two bedroom apartment. Uh, there's no reward for loyalty. There's no reward for the longevity of your relationship with that landlord. You're just essentially just pouring money down the drain. Then you've got the, the other part of that, which is if you want to actually buy a property, you've got to somehow come up with five to 10 percent and then you've got to have the income to be able to get that mortgage. If you can get those things, you're then paying that mortgage off for 30 odd years. And your hope is, is that you can get the capital gains in that asset to be able to realize that in some day, or you can get enough assets to then start renting them out and kind of, you know, get into that passive income bucket. But for a lot of us, that that's just totally out of reach. And so we just want to make that more, that simpler process to be able to become a collective owner. And so what we're doing is providing that derivative token uh, which is actually where the profit from the entire operation, not just your rental apartment, um, but the entire operation's profit feeds through to those derivative blocks. And we think it's a blueprint that we hope will be adopted by many other developers who are building projects because this issue is far bigger than what Wonderlife can solve. And, you know, and I guess the big thing for us is that the promise of Web3 around... Um, the ability to be able to trade, um, realize um, liquidity um, out of the portionalized or fractionalized ownership in an asset, we think is brilliant. So right now, if either of you know one of us owns a property, the only way we can realize the upside of that is to rent it out or to sell it. And then we have to find somewhere else to go. With Wonderblocks, what we want people to be able to do is to be able to accrue that passive income that they actually get through from the assets. If their life situation changes, they can sell a portion of it. They can sell all of it if they wanted to. If they wanted to hold on to it for the rest of their lives and pass it down to their kids, they can do that as well. And so we're, we're taking quite a, um, I think this is probably the interesting thing. We're thinking about what the exit looks like for the business at the start of even creating it. So we don't want to ever sell the underlying assets. That's the goal for us. Never sell those assets. They just keep accruing cash flow income back into the derivatives that go out to the community that live and work from these spaces. And, and ultimately for us, that's what I think the most powerful aspect of Web3 is. It's actually making your customers co-owners. This is like a is a really interesting concept behind the tokenization of the wonder blocks because it's not necessarily uh, exchanging a cryptocurrency for a goods or service. You're really it's a whole new uh, value proposition in terms of tokenization. Yeah. Michael, I know I know we've talked about this some with uh, water rights and etc. Is that you can really tokenize assets in a unique way because of what blockchain technology does. And I think look, you know that's that's the exciting thing here with. Not just, and I think this is, you know, I'm, um, I, I would class myself as a non-technical product manager. Um, I'm really, really into the outcomes that this technology can provide rather than necessarily the, um, how the, the blockchain might work in our instance. And that's why we're so uh, open to collaborating, partnering with other technology companies that are solving some of these big issues. Because, you know, um, for us, our hope is that we can create a um, an inclusive ecosystem where people can be buying their coffee downstairs in the cafes, going to the gym, you know, taking their dogs down to doggy daycare. Uh, and through that transactional process, actually be building rewards that allow them to do something with that, whether that's, you know, um, buying an NFT drop that we might do or a partner might do or, um or actually pulling that out in fiat currency um, to get that cash back, or what we hope is actually converting that into collective ownership. Um, we kind of feel like this is the future, and and I was having a thought the other day, and I don't know if you guys have the same challenge. You know, I've been a, a Netflix customer and a um, Spotify customer from the very start. You know, I've been with Spotify for like, I don't know, 10 plus years. I've spent thousands of dollars on my monthly subscriptions. I don't own a single CD. I don't own any music anymore. I don't pay that subscription for one month. I've lost access to my music. 
And so I think one of the things for me that's most, the most profound about blockchain and Web3 is this idea around my ownership in that data. And I think that's really, really profound. You know, what does it now mean for loyalty? At the moment with 99% of SaaS products, there is no loyalty. They have a KPI inside their business models around lifetime value and total lifetime yield, yet there is almost no incentive for me to be with them other than the consumption of what their product is. And if their product becomes commoditized like music has become, I now have a subscription with five other music apps. Why would I keep one over the other if none of them actually make me feel like I'm part of the company? And so, mm. yeah, I think I think it's a, um, I think we're on the the precipice of like a disruption that will completely transform how we as consumers interact with everything. And it's the it's the organisations that are investing in the technology and the processes around managing that will ultimately make that happen. Um, and you know, guys like us doing the user cases. Just to think about this for a minute now, <clears throat> we've seen a very popular thematic of the ecosystem, right? When you see tokens and the incentivization of the community to stay within the ecosystem, and typically the utility in those ecosystems is a digital outcome. You know, it's access to software, it's gaming. So it's quite interesting the step that you're taking uh, to to bridge halfway between an ecosystem and the real world. Mm. What I really like is this is solving an issue. The housing affordability crisis is a real thing that we live with today. This is not um, you've found a use for blockchain and you, know, you want to try and make a business out of it. You're solving a problem. And it's quite interesting that you can then pull a community and a lifestyle together through whether whether it's combined ownership and giving access to um, a, a derivative of ownership of real estate, or let's call it the broader enterprise, because as you say, it builds a community effect and you've got people brought together for a common cause, which is to to improve the your I suppose quality of life yep. in 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 your in your buildings, because you're all playing for the long-term outcome of, of mutual benefit through your, your ownership of your tokens. And this is really the interesting thing. I think we're just starting to see this come through where these ecosystems go beyond metaverse applications. This is a real world universe application. Um, that's what's quite exciting here. And then the other side of this that you mentioned, Nick, people have bills to pay, circumstances change. The fact that there is an open marketplace and liquidity for these tokens that look, if you need the money or this doesn't work for you anymore, um, there are exits, there's ins and outs. Absolutely. It, it adds a flexibility for, for folks that aren't necessarily, as you said, that you're not getting into the, everyone would love the equity of your own house and you know, your grass backyard and all the rest. Mm. This is a great opportunity to step in where prior to, like you say, you're renting or you're buying a house and renting it to five other folks to help cover the more, you know, subpar outcomes. And that's what I'm really excited about when we think about the application and the transparency and the, the, the mobility of tokens and the liquidity. It's a fantastic use case. Well done. Man. Yeah. Look, you know, I, I think it's, um, I mean, look, it's new territory, right? And as a user case goes, I mean, this is kind of obvious. I mean, the tokenization of physical assets like property is, is such a is such an obvious one for blockchain. And there is a few, you know, there's a few good examples of people looking at how they can do this. And I think one of the big things for me really is um, separating out the complexity of it all. So, like right now, a DAO can't own physical assets, um, and a big part of that is that it's a breach of kind of international um, investment guidelines. So if someone who lives offshore can then buy the direct ownership of that land in Australia, what does that mean for the local market? We're essentially now inflating prices to make that work. So what we're trying to do is create some, um, some principles that will allow us to move towards a decentralized autonomous organization that actually at its core puts the community first. So just really simple things like um, every participant in the ecosystem has a vote and those votes and on the proposals and the projects that we do are weighted based on its impact to the people who live there. So if we have a voting system that is um, fully geared towards your investors and your shareholders, often that is at the detriment of your actual consumers. 
um, because they have different wants and needs. At the end of the day, they're trying to realize a 30x return. And that 30x return means I have to drive revenue up, I have to drive costs down, uh, and I have to find ways to be lean. Um, now, if the if the model is around longevity and balance uh, and collective um, upside, it starts to change some of those levers where we're not saying, and I've had a few meetings with investors who are saying, hey, this is not a 30x play. Um, so if that's what you're looking for, um, this is not the project for you. Now, if you are looking for a project that has more transparency um, and what we believe are better outcomes for traditional property, um, then this is a great project for you to be involved in. Uh, and it becomes a foundation for other industry segments. So each one of our locations will have a co-working environment that can support a community of about 300 people. Now, those co-working spaces will be geared towards Web3 startups, uh, sports tech, climate tech businesses. So all of a sudden, we're now not only providing the environment for these people to kind of cohabitate and connect, but we're also becoming a first moving customer for them to test their ideas. So if you land in Sydney or if you land in Brisbane or wherever you land in the world and you go, hey, I really want to see what's happening on a storefront level with Web3, where would I go? I'd, I'd try and kind of wander around to maybe a few different co-working spaces, maybe some tech hub somewhere. But if we can actually create a thriving environment that actually can bring a lot of these facets together, people can actually start to see, well, what will the Web3 house look like 10 years from now what will be some of the technology we'll be using how do we create incentives mm. using blockchain to be more efficient with our energy with our water you know how do we reward people for better consum like consumption habits you know and i think that's the thing that for me is the I, I suppose the biggest opportunity here is taking like the play to earn methodologies and applying it to everything we do um, and that's why we've kind of coined the phrase, well, we'll steal it until someone else tells us they already came up with it, which probably everyone has, um, but live to earn, uh, rather than just play to earn. And so, yeah, look, um, there's a lot that we need to do. We've got to build a DeFi property fund that actually funds the buildings because we're trying to solve a couple of problems here. At the moment, the, uh, the finance mechanisms for construction are quite difficult. Um, and so we're, we're solving that problem at the same time as then activating those assets. And so, um, you know, we're obviously super ambitious, uh, 10 buildings, uh, $500 million over the next 10 years. Um, but look, our model uh, and the way that we've built it um, provides good liquidity for the community that are there and, and, and hopefully the ability for those communities to actually evolve and grow as, as the buildings mature. You need the DAO to fund to angel fund each little project. It's funny you should say that. Yeah. So you know, look, <laughs> and I think these are these are all great opportunities around um, the characteristics of people supporting. Like, if you look at like the great work that Virtual's been doing, uh, you know, um, Pledge Me and other equity crowdfunding platforms, they've made they've made the barrier of entry lower for people to be able to support the brands they love. Um, and when we start to look at that from a crypto space, you know, like technology, like what you guys are doing around multi signatory for the movement of money. So you don't have all money sitting in one account with one person's, you know, phrase to move it. I mean, bringing enterprise grade, um, you know, financial systems to kind of loose projects, I think is absolutely necessary. And I'm, I'm really interested in how, you know, organizations like virtual or, or pledge me or whoever it is will evolve into DAO mechanisms, potentially, um, that allow a much lower entry point for people to be able to realize the upside of supporting brands they love. Imagine being able to yep. support a project and walk into your local bottle store and being able to buy that um, bottle of whatever it is off the shelf and know that you're actually receiving reward points or liquidity from that transaction that you can realize at any time. because when you're buying shares in a business, you, you can't realize that liquidity unless there's a liquidity event. And so I'm sitting there with my shares in a business going, hopefully sometime in the next 10 years, you know? And, and so I think there's this really interesting opportunity around the secondary market that Web3 and blockchain provides that allows us to be able to realize those gains if we want, at the moment we want them. 
um, rather than necessarily being locked in for the long haul for the next 10 years in an idea. Yeah, and I mean, that that's the power of, if we see DeFi through to where it can go, just beyond, you know, the cryptocurrencies, but um, tokenizing and fractionalizing ownership in real things. Now, whether that's a physical thing, like the bottle you mentioned, you, the bottle of wine from a small producer, or you have an arrangement where you angel funded the producer to grow the grapes, and Perfect. then you have allocations. There's so much use. And then the tradability, if you don't want to drink that wine, if you're having a dry year, you may want to monetize the access to that wine. The, the efficiency and the transparency that blockchain brings uh, to these opportunities, and it's not always very evident or prevalent in the market um, that these even exist till we sit down with folks like yourself, who's been through the learning curve of, well, what can I do here to make this fairer and more efficient, that there's so many applications. And I mean, Joe and I get on every week and speak to people and bang on about uh, the efficiency of blockchain, but then we've got a real world to work with. And with corporates, that they have their um, real world regulations. They've got their compliance they need to meet. And this is the real issue, right? Um, as, as crypto and as the broader digital asset space evolves, it's always been an enthusiast activity. You, you store your, your digital assets on a thumb drive or on your telephone. So obviously, and you already hinted to it, Nick, that's what Unidu works to solve, to, to match compliance and regulatory requirements for businesses so they can play in this field. And this is what I'm really excited about when you get to be, beyond, let's not worry about Bitcoin for a second here, the, um, the application of, of uh, how you would manage holding tokens um, uh, for any kind of fractionalization of a real world product or access to a product or angel funding a project or uh, equity shares in, in co-living, uh, co-working spaces. Um, these are the real things that we need to find a middle ground with where corporates sit because DAO, everyone understands the concept of a DAO. How does it apply to the Corporations Act in Australia? Well, there's no bridging at the moment. They're not recognised as entities, so that needs to be solved. I believe it can be solved. Um, and once we do get there and we can have this ubiquitous um, tokenization efforts over any kind of asset or membership, uh, that's where I think the markets become really efficient and then finance evolves. So it's, it's a really interesting spot where we live, where we're waiting for the regulation, but folks like yourselves have already got your road, your roadmap ready of, well, we're going to build a DAO. We're achieving these things. We're getting the, the hard assets together. Yeah. And funnily enough, people are interested, right? People are piling in because there's enough pioneers out there that, um, people believe this is the future, including everyone on the call. So, so look, you know, one of the big things, if we talk about like pivotal moments around the fractionalization and tokenization of physical assets has to be JP Morgan's partnership with BlackRock this week. That is the tokenization of a billion, uh, trillion dollars, sorry, a trillion dollars worth of uh, physical assets to be tokenized. I mean, you know, that's, that's a pretty strong um, indication that we might be onto something. And, and I think a big part of this is just, um, we are really pro regular um, regulation we're uh, working through the process of actually getting our um our asfl license asfl bloody acronyms um you know actually getting that license so that we can have the rigor to be able to provide that transparency around the prospectus that we put forward yeah. um and I, and i think you know um it's around collaboration with players in the market who are working on different elements of it, right? You know, we don't have to build everything. Um, it's around kind of being able to create meaningful partnerships. And again, this is the interesting thing. So, you know, if I think about what the future of our relationships are as, um, as creators, as founders, as businesses, it won't be very long before we'll sit down and negotiate a number of tokens in our business for your business. You'll provide tokens to us. And that becomes a really easy and quite transferable way for us to be able to find a JV and work together because now we have transparency and a vested interest in each other's success. And I think at some degree, we're going to move away as being an hourly based employee force and we'll be a value based employee force where we actually hold yep. those tokens as well as whatever the underlying currency is. 
and a company can, you know, like if I'm working for Amazon, yeah, I've got shares in it. What do I do with those shares? What do I do with it? But mm. if I held, if I had utility tokens in Amazon as a staff member, I'm now actually realizing a percentage of the gains of that business. You know, yeah, that helps me to make the justification in my head to push a bit harder on the work that I'm doing or come up with a more innovative way of doing things because I'm directly getting rewarded yep. for it. And, you know, yep. it, it's we've got to share the pie to build a bigger pie. <laughs> it's, uh, we, we can't just have one person holding the pie and then everyone else going, well, why would I, be, why would I bother? <laughs> You know? Yeah, just, it's a perfect yeah. way of running yeah. mechanics for incentivization at the end of the day um, at, at Unidu, all, all, all our staff uh, to one degree or another are getting tokens in return uh, uh, other than other personal arrangements for employment. Why? Because uh, incentivization. Joe's in the US um, busting himself at night to get on uh, because he believes in the mission yep. and hopefully there'll be an economic return for him because he's directly incentivized for his hard work. It's, it's a great mechanism when there is a healthy secondary market and it's immediate and it's liquid mm. to incentivize folks. And like you say, utility just beyond cashing in people at Amazon. What if you got Amazon prime access for free because your state tokens like, there's, there's so many applications where you move just beyond a, a cash per hour basis work and add real incentivization. And we're going to see this kick through, right? Because, um, well, well, we're going to see this kick through as we tokenize access to real world stuff that we do today. And I mean, Nick, you've given us so many examples while we've been talking today. You could sit here for hours and just, I mean, I could go through the bills on my credit card and figure out how much would this be a better arrangement. Yep. Yeah. If I was receiving incentive tokens for my phone, my internet, all these different things, would I be shopping around to find plans or would I be staying because I'm accruing and I believe in what I'm doing and I'm seeing a return, whether it's cash and I'm, it's liquid or other incentives or utilities that I get out of these tokens. It's early yeah, days look, I, I think... and you know, when and nothing else, right? So it's really an educational matter. To, to get this mainstream, these concepts, that these are important aspects of life and we can make these fair and transparent and uh, broader, more returning, uh, more rewarding life, hopefully. Yeah, look, I, I couldn't agree more. And, and I guess, you know, what I'm really thinking about is, um, you know, over the last decade, as, as a technology founder myself, and, you know, and, and I've been in the, uh, you know, WAS, so workspace as a service, um, but seeing, I think we're at peak SaaS, I think we're at that, we're at the peak of that model, where we all are getting, uh, like, atrophied from, like, just being overloaded with apps that we subscribe to. I mean, I realized the other day that I had three different subscriptions to Canva. Um, the three different other, like I was describing to it on three different email accounts and wondering why I'm paying for it three yeah. times. And, and the rigmarole of actually trying to, and this is not a criticism of Canva, you know, they're great, great company, but, but the antiquated way of actually dealing with that and trying to go, hang on a sec, it's the same credit card going on three different accounts connected to my name, but they're on different email addresses. Like, this seems super fragmented. Why can't I solve this problem really easily? And I think it's because we've reached this entropy point with, um, with the, you know, sort of, um, with SaaS products. It's just, it's just not sustainable anymore. I mean, I have like, I don't know, five or six different like content streaming platforms. I don't even know now what content I'm watching, what platform it's even on. I just, you just say, you just kind of by default say Netflix. But it's on like 15 <laughs> different platforms. And so yeah, I don't, I don't want to be on that anymore. I would rather be able to pay a thousand bucks to get a utility token in a platform and actually be able to cut through all of that noise and now actually be a, a producer and supporter of shows rather than just a commoditized consumer of content. And, and I think, you know, as an avid gamer, as an avid consumer of content, like I'm sick of sitting on the edge being fed this stuff. I actually want to be part of the conversation and participate in it. And I think that's going to be the big wake up call for a lot of mainstream corporate businesses where overnight their customers, the relationship with their customers and their product is fundamentally changing. 
And whether they like it or not, yes. they're going to have to either adapt with it or someone's going to come in and go, uh, you thought you were in the energy business? No, mate, you're in the food business because that energy turns into the oven that heats your food that you eat. And like we've just taken your entire market away. And so the monopolies are changing. And um, yeah, I guess maybe I'm an anarchist at heart, but I, I feel like, you know, <laughs> I feel like there's a lot of exciting prospects here if we can move above just talking about fucking NFTs and bored apes and, you know, and we can talk about real shit. Like, how do we solve real problems? Not every cryptocurrency is trying to be the exchange of value or the next US dollar or Bitcoin. There's plenty of use cases behind tokenizing real world things because it's a more efficient process than the legacy structures in place. Yeah, absolutely. I don't, I don't even call those crypto. Look, at the end of the day, cryptocurrencies, they're a currency. They're, they're a measure of exchange. Sometimes they have a utility attached to them. ETH has a utility, of course, to use the Ethereum network and processing. But it's largely a, an exchange value at this point. Too. There is so many uses for real world applications that just needs efficient settlement, true transparent recording of what happened and the ability to monetize it. We've seen over well over a decade now that blockchain is and digital assets is up to the job. It's now getting creative on how you digitize these assets. Frankly, the, the digitization simply of, a, of an office block that has been around. Mm. So then pushing, pushing the envelope to where Nick's doing, moving into the ecosystem and make it more about the consumer rather than just dividing up and making freely tradable, you know, square meterages. I think that's where you're going to get, and he touched on it just a moment ago, the anarchist view, the, you know, going back to the corporations and turning the paradigm upside down. That is where you, that is where this is going, right? It may not be next year, but that is where this is going when you have transparent ownership where, um, there aren't the monopolies that control and everyone stands on the same footing. Now, I don't think corporations should take this as a threat. It's just the wake up call to move with innovation. You know, when the internet came along, me included, I got it, as I said last week, I had ICQ and I couldn't search or find anything with the internet to begin with. And I went, this is a waste of time. And um, I, <laughs> I have eaten my words because if my internet goes down for three days, I go back to the stone age. Um, Getting your head around new innovative technologies at the start is a benefit to what you do. If you wait until it's too late and you're finding there's a cutover, then it's a pain because you're too late. And I suppose that's what we preach week in, week out for the, the corporates to embrace what blockchain and digital assets can do, because it is just beyond Bitcoin. You don't need to believe in the capital appreciation abilities of Bitcoin. You can get involved in crypto and not own Bitcoin. There is so many applications, and if you accept the premise of what we're talking about here and you look at the evidence over a decade, I mean, crypto and digital assets are not going away, uh, you're going to be faced with, with a point that you're going to have to change. So get ahead of the curve now and get educated on what token uh, tokenization can do for your business and start making the preparations, whether it's just education and learning or it's getting a wallet to hold these things that work with your corporate um, your corporate governance uh, or, or stepping in and buying new assets. You can dip the toes. And the great thing about to tokenization is it's not a minimum $100,000 entry. It, it's, um, it's a fraction of a token. You, you can buy less of an asset than the gas you paid to acquire, it, if you so wish. Mm. It, the, the opportunity is now the cost is, I'm going to say, de minimis. And you can either sit on your hands or you can get up the curve now and be ready for when uh, this, when, when, when there's really emphasis to move and you can be too late or you can be prepared. That's how I view this. I, I think that's great, Michael. And, you know, look, I, I, I think about the experience again, just for someone who's renting an office space or someone who's renting a, an apartment, you know, we can, we are literally creating value for someone else's asset. We are paying off their mortgage. Um, yeah, yep. often we can't go and get the mortgage ourselves, which seems nonsensical. Like, you know, you can pay your rent and, and this is the weird thing. Your office lease and your rent do not affect your credit rating. So like the yes. fact that you pay your rent every week and you know, 99% of us do, 
um, doesn't help your credit rating. But if you miss your phone bill, which is like, you know, 1% of what you pay in your rental income, suddenly your credit rating stuffed. And it's, and it's the system's been gamed and, you know, and it just doesn't work. When you sit down and look through the numbers, we're not creating new numbers out of anywhere. We're not creating new revenue streams. All we're doing is clearing out all the layers of bureaucracy that take that money from the people who are supporting the creation of those assets from the people who ultimately pay for it and just making that more balanced. Nick, you great. Yeah. You gave a great example regarding phone bills, like regarding phone bills affecting your credit score and not rent. Do you think that comes down to a tech technology lag within the renting market that landlords are not into some database where they could all enter their information, whereas a telecommunications company can easily do that? Look, I, I think there's something a little bit more nefarious to it than that. Um, unfortunately, I think the technology has always been there. You know, you have organizations like RTA, which is your governing entity for managing your bond and, and your liabilities as a renter. Yet RTA don't focus on anything that happens from your doorway into the hallway for the communal spaces of the apartment buildings we live in. So I think there's a there's a policy, there's some broken links in the policies. There's also, there's um, like all of these things, people are like, where's the money come from for me to worry about doing dealing with that stuff? Where's my value? And when you've got yeah. a building that's built with a bunch of speculative offshore investors, who are essentially looking for the greatest yield they can get out of that apartment, they don't care. As long as they're getting rent, they, they don't care if the building falls down around you unless it affects their ability to get rent. And so I think, you know, if we if we just simplify some of the stuff, what happens with a phone? You don't get, you, you're, you'll just jump carrier. You know, like there is no lock-in now. And so, you know, when it comes to accommodation and those kind of things, there is a bit, the barrier for, actual movement between suppliers is non-existent and the monopolization of business models is completely like there is no option it's you rent or you get a mortgage there's no other option even the rent to own options out there you're paying down your deposit to then have to go and get a mortgage so and if you leave before you pay down the deposit you get nothing and if you can't get your mortgage at the end or you want to move country, man, you've just paid down, you know, thousands of dollars on that rent for five years. And you pick up and go, I've got a new job in another market. You've, you've just lost everything. You've got nothing to show for it. And so, I again, I, I feel like the more of us that talk about the practical mainstream opportunities of um, changing the relationship between commoditization with our customers and our partnership, it just... It just blows all of this noise out of the water because, I mean, if you're any financial controller in a business, you're caring about cost of acquisition, churn rates, profitability, you know, you're caring about all of those things. And as each of these markets get more and more commoditized, you sit there going, man, how are we going to make money? Okay, we're going to have to let all of our staff go. We're going to have to replace them with bots. Cool. You know, that's one way to do it. <laughs> What if you changed your entire relationship with your customer where they benefited from your success and you benefited from their success? There's more than enough money to go around. It's, it's just the models that we've been using for the last hundred years. Uh, they just collect wealth in a very small group of people from other people. <laughs> if you share that wealth, guess what we all do? We all spend more money. Like, I mean, you look at like, a, I don't know if you've talked to many people over the pandemic who are on baseline incomes that were coming through because they'd lost their jobs and they were working from home. Yeah. There were many of these people who are on very low incomes before the pandemic happened. And they were able, just with that little bit of help from the government, to be able to actually use some of that money and do other stuff. You know, and, and I think this is the interesting thing. More money into the system means more people spend money. <laughs> it's like, you just need to create a way yeah. to keep that cycle running a bit smoother. You know, as technology advances, sometimes we don't realize how fast it's moving and the capabilities that it unlocks. Now we're able to actually tokenize real estate, whereas 10 years ago, the infrastructure layer was not there. We had no trusted blockchains that you could actually have all that information live on, whereas now everyone's understanding, hey, this is a possibility. 
Yeah, I, I always think that the technology is like a decade ahead of the actual user cases. In some cases, maybe you know two or three decades. Um, like I said before, I'm I'm not a technologist. You know, I want to work with people who are technologists. Um, my focus is on the experience that we can deliver to our community, and then having smart partnerships and, and you know with the right people. So um, I'm part of a team of eight um, co-founders. That's a lot of people. <laughs> Uh, we all have the exact same uh, utility blocks that we'll have in the project. I don't have anything different because I'm CEO. Um, we all collectively benefit in the reward that comes from what we're doing. Um, and no one in our ecosystem can have any more of our utility blocks than, than the market cap. And so you have to be, you know, it, it essentially just deals with greed. Like you can, we can all have successful careers and we can all make liquidity. But we do have to create some structures that actually basically make that more transparent. You know, like, I don't think, you know, I, I'll say that, you know, Jeff or, or, or Elon, you know, that perhaps the pursuit was to be, you know, trillionaires. But actually, they're, they're, it's a byproduct of, of a commercial system that kind of, it just grows. And, and, you know, Elon's a fantastic example of this richest man in the world. It's not like his bank account's full of cash. He's got shares and options, yeah. which are very difficult to actually realize the, the value of those. You know, I've been a millionaire many times on paper. That doesn't mean I've been a millionaire in my bank account. You know, like, you know, it's, it's the two yeah. different things. Oh, it's, yeah. The broader sense here is um, there is a social good play to all of this. And I think the pandemic is probably been a catalyst to changing how we operate. We don't get on cattle onto the trains and, and pour into the big buildings in the city, in Sydney, for example. People are now trusted, there's proof they can do it and they work from home. People want to do things differently. And I mean, uh, maybe it's just the sense that I have that there's a willing for change, that pe people want to do things differently. And these projects that put a social good around an economic outcome, at the end of the day, this is about co-owning something and, and having a stake uh, with all the, the other benefits, that, that there is a social good to this. And, and I think crypto to deliver a social good, blockchain is perfect for it because the nature of it, it's transparent, it's efficient, it's permissionless. These are, uh, it's a fantastic platform to deliver these underlying, it can be a business, I'm not talking about charities necessarily, but businesses which have social good in mind. So it's a fantastic platform. And again, corporates, they can have a social good um, policy or maybe they don't, maybe they don't subscribe to that and that's fine. Um, but why stay away from the enterprises and the ecosystems of social good when you can get on something like the blockchain Maybe they provide liquidity in and out for uh, for your tokens, Nick. You know, there, 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 is, there is an economic need for liquidity providers from time to time. That, that you know, um, principal trading desks are probably despised by most, but uh, they provide liquidity. There's no reason that the two different um, schemes can't coexist. And, and the blockchain allows that because of its interoperability and its transparency. I won't keep banging on. I've said it a million times. Um, just get your heads around what the opportunity is because the wave is coming. Um, don't be ready to move when it breaks. Have a, have a look at the opportunities now. We've got folks like Nick that have been doing this uh, and at the start. And it's always hard at the start, right? Because it's not mainstream. So you're spending time that it may be a, a sunk cost. Yeah. But if you look at the longevity of blockchain to date, how far it's building and the different users that come out year after year and use cases that come out year, year after year, um, I think it's a safe bet. Yeah, look, look um, I mean, I suppose this is the interesting thing. Um, you know, we built a really successful services business, um, you know, through the recession and then out of it, um, you know, uh, and, and these things come in cycles. And I think it's really important that when we're in the down cycle, you know, obviously we, you know, I feel for anyone who's lost, you know, huge volumes of cash. Um, but, but also too, you know, like buying as the cycle's reaching, reaching its peak and you're buying into the hype. And, you know, like if I'm buying a property and that property is now worth a million dollars, 
you know, like the, the, the ability for people to buy that property is getting lower and lower and lower. You know, so I, I rationally I have to think, okay, we must be getting close to the to the ceiling because the only people that can buy that now are investors that are looking for rent roll out of that. And there's an absolute ceiling for what people can pay to live somewhere. Like, you know, like there's yep. it, it's a tipping point and you go and I look, you know, after thousands and thousands of people paying monthly subscriptions to work from our co-working spaces, I could see that if I changed if I and I dynamically changed a lot of our our memberships, you know, often to test some of these things. And if you changed it by like twenty five bucks a month, you would actually increase your churn, and you could inevitably you might increase by twenty five bucks, but you're actually losing a hundred bucks because now you're putting downward pressure on a lot of the people who are coming in who are going, man, now, geez, I'm I'm gonna have to drop my membership back because that that threshold that you're doing on top of everything else I've got, you've now hit my ceiling. And then I'm having to spend more money on staff for activating to make the space better. Like, you you know, like, I think you have to take a bit of a systems approach and look at it as a kind of living organism to go, you know, sometimes little changes can have really profound negative effects. Um, because you just didn't really look at that whole cycle through. So, yeah, look, I, I'm I'm really excited. Um, you know, it's tough being at the start of the market, but then you know we're not we're not actually doing anything uh, that's totally different. You know, all it is is we're we're just saying there's might be a better way to co-share in the upside and the reward of of these collective assets. Um, and provide transparency around the risk mitigation for those who become investors and those who become people who live and work in the spaces. You know, um, the models aren't working, so it's a good time for us to maybe test some of those assumptions and, and shift the models. It's just innovation. You're taking something that has existed for quite some time and innovating the marketing of it and, and the delivery of it to fix a problem. And I mean, again, for our listeners, that's the takeaway, right? The, don't get into into blockchain and digital assets because you've come up with a new invention or you need to invent something. Innovate with what you sell. And there are better ways to deliver and market those things. Uh, and, and we have a proven technology here in blockchain. It's ready to go. There's a clear use case here. The problem is you either rent or you own. But if you don't want to rent or own, this is another option where you get to build equity while you rent. It's, it's yeah. a problem that's already there. Look, yeah, guys, guys, I reckon, um, and, and, you know, and this is why I really love organizations like yourselves that are putting the heavy lifting into how all the mechanics work, how do those things work? Because then people like me can focus on the experience and, and the delivery uh, and then, you know, work with the partners who are putting all of that investment into the, the underlying kind of technology in there. You know, let's think about like food security. It's a huge issue in Australia. It's a huge issue in New Zealand. You know, by by actually creating a tokenized farm that allows me to invest in that farm and be able to get discounted produce directly to my my kitchen table, um, but also help that farmer to be able to provide um, the right infrastructure to drive that farm forward, you know, and remove the monopoly that the large grocers have, the large, you know, resellers who just basically push the profit down like it just changes it all i'm getting actually cheap i'd get cheaper produce through a tokenized relationship with an organic farmer than i can from going down to woolies and buying it the ones that should be yeah worried are actually woolworths and and coles these guys should be really nervous that actually the barrier through smart technology like what you guys are building has never been more accessible you know, to actually like totally disrupt that. What if a whole suburb decided to partner with a couple of farms and that whole suburb now has, you know, fresh organic food? Like it's completely doable. What would that mean for cops? Because they've been relying on the fact that they're the only place you can go. And I'm not trying to single them out, but I think it's, I think, you know, everyone gets caught up in the hype of, of crypto and NFTs and these kind of things and games and metaverse and VR, you know, like those things are cool, but actually simple shit, power, water, energy, housing, food, 
man, those are the things that are commoditized at the moment and those are the things ripe for disruption. And I think companies like yours, perhaps companies like ours, we're just bringing a smarter, more transparent way at a traditional industry and, you know, it's game on. That's it. I'm excited. So we're we're, we're <laughs> preaching from the same book here, Nick. I've got one hilarious story about timing and what happens when you're in a bit of an old fucker like me. I'm in my 40s. Uh, sorry for the, you know, but I'm assuming the consumers will be watching this are probably like all of us and talk like sailors. But, you know, like, um, so back in 2010, early 2010, my co-founder rings me in the middle of the night and he says, man, I'm just going through our power bill for our office. This is our first office in Auckland. And he's like, our power bill's gone up. By like, it's like doubled over, over month, like in one month, it's like doubled. We've gone from like 700 bucks to like $1,400 in a month. He's like, what's going on? I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm not sure. And he's like, dude, it's just really weird. And so I was like, bro, I, I live just down the road from our co-working space. So I said, I'll just go down and have a recce and see what's happening in the middle of the night. Because I said, nothing's happening during the day. So I'll go and check it out. Roll into the office and I catch one of our community members red-handed uh, Bitcoin mining. And he had uh, he had been bringing in in his car at night a whole rack of Bitcoin mining machines, and he like had like thirty Bitcoin mining machines in our in our co-working space. And I'm like, dude, what the what the fuck are you doing? And he's like, bro, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. I just you guys have the fastest internet, and I just needed to set this up because we had like gigabit internet back in like 2010, yeah, um, which was unprecedented in New Zealand. And like, and he's like, dude, look. Um, to say sorry, I can transfer like 20 Bitcoin to you guys if you've got a digital wallet and I'll give you 20 Bitcoin and I can pay you two Bitcoin per month plus the rent <laughs> to keep doing it. And what did I turn around like an idiot? I'm on the phone to my, my business partner. I'm like, bro, this, this idiot's trying to pay us in this random currency. How am I going to pay my mortgage in Bitcoin? What the fuck? Where do I even get this money at? 20 Bitcoin, just straight off. I think I could have pushed him to 100. You know, and I mean, shit, think of like, you know, think of what that would be worth, you know, and, and I know we're in the, we're in the, you know, everyone's really, uh, you know, scared at the moment as the, we're plummeting out on those valuations. But, you know, like you've got Google, look at the previous ones. This is not different. It's no different to the cycles we've had before. And it's no different to anything else. The market gets a bit too inflated. Everyone kind of panics and then it drops. And then people go, oh, okay, that's cool. And I'll start going up again. And it's like, man, I just don't don't be that person. I think you know the lesson for me in this, and I've had this a couple of times. Don't be don't be that person who just reacts and doesn't think further ahead and think, you know, shit. Am I right at the cusp of another Bitcoin moment where I could have been getting Bitcoin for two hundred dollars or one hundred and fifty bucks? And even if it drops out. It's still worth fucking twenty grand. You know, like, what other what yeah. other possible asset could have I bought that low that would still be worth that now? You know, like none. So there are folks that look at charts and resistance bands and buy and sell based off that. We're, we're in a um, in the early stages still of crypto adoption. Worrying where the bid and ask spread is um, and trading it you know, within a band, you're always going to have these danger moments oh, yeah. and something's overpriced, underpriced. Or you can take a fundamental view that roll this forward 20 years, you can imagine a wallet in, on everyone's phone and it takes up half of their expenditure and their life interactions. Um, I don't care if I'm, if I'm reaching a ceiling or a floor on my trading bands on the, on the trade station when you think of the, the long play. Um, you know, so you ride through these these crashes, the old markets falling apart. There's an efficiency to that. Some of the some uh, projects won't survive, some will. But as a technology, as a broader asset class, you know, you look at the long game, how this could affect everyone's life. Yep. And it's internet, right? It's like trading the early internet um, Yahoo miles back when they indexed the internet, right? Totally. Where could that go? You know, you wait 15, well, probably 25 years now, isn't it? Um, but, you know, I think I think I was disappointed I sold out of a few things back then. you gotta <laughs> stay, you got to stay true and believe in the mission, I think. Oh, yeah. And and just a bit of common sense, I think, you know, doesn't, you know, it's, it's um, 
if and again this is not financial advice here but like you know when you look at the fact that 88 percent of the entire u.s currency is being printed in the last two years you, you you have to kind of go look you know we're working with quite ineffective models you know like we, we you know the models that we're all kind of dealt at the moment aren't, aren't you know they're suboptimal um and that's why there's a yep. lot of chaos going on around the world but if we get back to the basic principles of going hey someone needs to eat someone needs to sleep somewhere someone needs to drink something you know like all of these basic human necessities and and i, I look at it and i think as a country like australia you know like as the world moves towards you know renewable energy towards um electrification like i mean you know we as a country are sitting on a literal gold mine to actually make that work and then you know uh, all of the other technology that comes in behind that i just think is is just incredible so yeah i mean look maybe i'm just internally optimistic or i just have stockholm syndrome and i can't recognize bad times anymore but you know like <laughs> you've, you've just got to you've just got to swing for it that's it you've just got to swing yeah. make smart decisions yeah. and give it a go build in solving Roll for the off. problems that are already here today we don't have to invent new ones Awesome. Well, you guys, uh, we're running up on our on our hour time slot here. I just want to say thank you guys so much for this incredible talk and letting our listeners know a little bit about the practical applications behind blockchain and what it solves for. Everyone, you can find Nick's LinkedIn profile down below as well as Michael's. Thank you guys for joining us for another episode of Unity Talks. Have a good day. Pleasure, Joe. Thanks Bye. for joining, Nick. See you guys.